Great. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm so happy to see that we have a goodly group here joining us on Zoom this morning for our 17th annual Michael A. Creighton Memorial Lecture on Aging. Uh, that's 17 years gone by quite quickly, it seems like. This morning, uh, we have one of our own as a speaker. Amanda Shelley is a graduate of our PA program in 2005. And in a few minutes, she'll be presenting. I'd like to just lay a few uh, ground rules down uh, so that you understand how we're going to conduct this uh, and know how we're going to take questions at the end. So uh, the chat feature is currently disabled, but will be turned on when Amanda completes her presentation. At that time, you can go in and type in your questions and we'll be taking questions off the chat and she'll be responding again at the end of the lecture. Amanda <coughs> is a as I mentioned, uh, uh, one of our own. Uh, she is currently the virtual medical director uh, for One Medical, which is a multi-state primary care group. And she is the co-founder and president of PAs in virtual medicine and telemedicine. And she has been doing telemedicine now full-time for five years and brings a great deal to the table in terms of what our students can expect and hopefully give us some insight into what the future of telemedicine is going to be like, uh, both for us as educators, as well as our students. So without further ado, I'm going to turn the presentation over to Amanda. Thank you so much, Elton. Let me share my screen, make sure everyone can see it. All right, are you looking at my presentation? Okay. All right, so thank you so much for that, uh, for the invitation, first of all, and, and the introduction. Um, as you mentioned, I am Amanda Shelley, and just a little bit more about me before diving in. Um, I am an ATSV graduate from 2005, um, after taking kind of a winding road to medicine. Um, straight out of school, I worked in pediatrics and then urgent care, and then moved over to a mobile geriatrics company where I saw patients in, um, uh, memory cares and assisted living facilities. And that's where, where I really fell in love with the geriatric pa patient population. Um, unfortunately, that company kind of imploded business-wise, so I had to move on. And I stumbled on to one medical that was just opening up in Arizona. Um, initially, I was very excited about the position just because it meant working from home. And I had a small child at the time, never thought I would be able to do that. Um, since joining, I actually just hit six years. I joined in 2015. I have not touched a patient in my paid practice. I do do some volunteer work and keep my skills up that way. Um, but work-wise, I haven't actually physically touched a patient. Um, and for the past four years, I've actually been managing a team of PAs and NPs doing the same work. And it was about three years into it that a colleague of mine, Desmond Watt, and I started kicking around the idea of starting a group for PAs doing telemedicine. We had been hearing about a few companies hiring PAs here and there, but there was no central resource for PAs working in telemedicine, no advocacy on our behalf with the government or with large employers, no best practice sharing, just nothing out there. So we launched PAs in virtual medicine and telemedicine in November of 2018. And since then, we've had some really exciting growth and advocacy projects. Uh, PAVMT is a 501c6 nonprofit and a caucus within the AAPA now. And our group has gone, grown really exponentially, especially over the last year. We now have over 6,000 followers on our social media groups and over 400 paid members at pavmt.org. And our goal with this group is to increase PA access and involvement in the virtual space via advocacy, legislation, and education. And ultimately, these things lead to more employment of PAs in the telemedicine arena. So before diving in, just a couple of quick disclaimers. I'm not a lawyer and I'm not a business expert, so please don't take anything I say here as advice on either count. Um, the laws are changing with lightning speed in telemedicine, so it's really up to you to look into the laws and the regulations before getting started in your state, wherever you end up practicing. Also, any products or companies I mentioned are just for education purposes. We, they're not endorsements, and I have no financial disclosures. All right, so we're here doing an annual focus on, on aging, talking about telemedicine, and it seems a little counterintuitive, 
and we will get to to talking about our elderly populations in just a bit, but it's important for us to understand some basics around telemedicine before diving in. And to begin with, telemedicine definitions really vary depending on the source. Some say telemedicine is the same as telehealth and virtual health and virtual care. And as a side note here, I will be using all of these terms interchangeably throughout the talk. Some designate the term telemedicine as, a, as the care provided by PAs, NPs, and physicians and use the other terms for any other services delivered via this care or via this mode. The Health Resources and Services Administration defines telemedicine as the use of electronic information and telecommunications technologies to support and promote long distance clinical health care, patient and professional health related education, public health and health administration. And the American Telemedicine Association's definition is as brief as their logo. It's, they say that telemedicine is defined as technology-enabled health and care management and delivery systems that extend capacity and access. So we have these varying definitions. So, and let's take a look at how big telemedicine is. And telemedicine and telehealth have actually been around for, in some capacity for quite some time. If you just take a look at this magazine cover from 1924, it already foretold of an alternate modality for delivering care via technology. And NASA, not surprisingly, has been heavily invested and engaged in telehealth utilization since the early 60s and are continuing to expand their investment in this area. Here on the ground, percentage-wise, the use of telemedicine has historically been pretty small. So let's take a look at some pre-COVID numbers. Statistically, commercial insurance claims for telehealth visits in 2019 were a very small percentage of visits. However, this doesn't really capture all of the telehealth that was going on as many of the telemedicine direct to consumer applications are done on a cash pay basis. And these numbers also don't reflect the Medicare and Medicaid numbers. But even though this number is small, the growth pre-COVID was huge. In fact, from 2014 to 20. 18, the use of telehealth, telehealth grew 1,393%. And that's obviously well be, before COVID-19. Uh, since the beginning of the pandemic, we know that millions of visits that would have been done in person are now being done virtually. Unfortunately, not all of that current data is going to be captured because initially insurers, including Medicare, were telling people to use the regular billing codes that would have been used if the person had been seen in, in person. So some of that data is truly gonna be lost. However, we know that a lot of the move to telemedicine is going to become permanent as people learn just how, how useful this mode of care delivery can be. In fact, from June 19 to June of 2020, we saw an increase of 4,132% to around 7% of private insurer claim lines. Again, this doesn't include Medicare and Medicaid claims, and it's only a few months into the pandemic, so we expect this number to be much bigger for the second half of the year. And here's just a graphic representation of the 2014 uh, outlook for telemedicine. You can see that back in 2014, about half of it was telehealth that was direct to consumer, and then the, about 35% was used around hospital or facility discharge planning and a thir about 13% for consults. By 2018, we saw this huge shift into direct-to-consumer, provider-to-patient, non-hospital-based offerings. And it wasn't that the use of the other segments were, was dying off, it was just that there was this huge gross growth in the direct-to-consumer space. So we know it's growing, but you may be wondering who's actually using it. And the fact is that no matter what specialty or what type of care you're delivering, it's likely that either you will be implementing telemedicine in some way in the future, or at the very least, your patients will be accessing care via telemedicine with other providers in some way. Pre-COVID, these were the areas that, that used telemedicine the most, according to a study in 2019. Radiology is obviously done via store and forward technology a lot where a clinic or a hospital doesn't have on-site radiology. So they, they come in first all the time. Um, you can see that geriatrics is actually in the top 10 here. And some people are surprised by that, um, thinking that our geriatric po population would be tech averse. Uh, but the fact is that 
as the baby boomers move into the aging and, and geriatric space, they're actually much more tech savvy. Um, and if they're like my mom, they are on their smartphones all the time. So they're much better set up to, to start using telemedicine. And these were the areas that use the use telemedicine the least. You can see where traditional in-hospital anesthesiologists, anesthesiology would be hard to, to phone in. Um, with the onset of COVID though, every one of these outside of anesthesiology is now using telemedicine in some shape or form with both initial and follow-up appointments being done virtually. And it's not just private practices that are getting in on this. Um, these are just some of the examples of really huge companies either getting directly involved in the direct-to-consumer space or making sure that their employers or even consumers have, have access to telemedicine care. In the area of physical and occupational therapy, we've seen explosive growth that is expected to continue past COVID. Um, early on in the pandemic, around May of last year, the American Physical Therapy Association surveyed about 6,500 members about the impact of COVID in their practice. And the survey showed that prior to the pandemic, 98% of PTs were not using telehealth at all for patients. And of those that were, most were seeing less than one patient per week on average. By May of 2020, that number jumped to 50%, and that was just a couple of months into the pandemic. The market for these services is projected to triple in size worldwide, going from $3.32 billion in 2019 to a projected $9.13 billion in 2027. And a large part of that growth is actually coming from tech advances with things like head-mounted displays, sensor motion track, tracking systems, and haptic devices, uh, which are making delivering care virtually much more, much easier. Um, in the last year, because of COVID, we've obviously seen a lot of growth in spite of not having this new equipment. Um, and studies are showing that patients are still getting huge benefits. Multiple studies now are showing equivalent outcomes for many types of rehab, uh, such as post-joint care, post-CVA care, that sort of thing. And other studies are also showing that patients are really happy with the outcomes, with patient satisfaction scores in the high 90th percentiles. Unfortunately, reimbursement is still lagging, uh, just as it is for most of telehealth. And just like for the other areas, it's really creating barriers to care. Audiology-wise, there really was very limited use of telehealth tech prior to COVID-19. Um, what little there was was seen mostly in rural settings, rural outlying clinics, or some VA setups. And this is mostly due to the fact that audiology is so equipment heavy and it's not easily done with just a simple smartphone or a computer that's in a patient's home. This has begun to change a little bit, however. Um, there are online or self-administered hearing testing now available out there in the direct-to-consumer space. These are still in the very, very early stages and obviously not as accurate as in-clinic assessments, but can be useful in some situations. Um, there are also peripheral tools that can help to transmit an otoscopic exam, and I'll talk about those in just a minute. Um, for hearing aids, many manufacturers are now making remote programming possible. Not all manufacturers are doing a great job of this. In fact, one I, I know of um, rolled out remote programming, but it required an entirely separate new device that had to be delivered to the patient, um, whereas some others are actually making this possible through a smartphone app. Um, for auditory training and tinnitus, there are now multiple apps and tools for smartphones and so on. And so there's, there seems to be more coming out every day. It's just important to be aware of what your patients may be looking at and trying to use. Teledentistry-wise, uh, it was growing even pre-pandemic, most significantly in the public and rural health sectors, as well as in school-based programs. And of course, you don't have to go further than any further than your TV to see just how many direct-to-consumer dental services are available now for things like straightening and whitening. And these are not without controversy, however, and obviously the quality varies. Teledentistry is now being used to try and combat some drop in, in office care that we lost during the pandemic. Um, the ADA Health Policy Institute reported in a study in November of 2020 that patient volumes in dental offices had only risen to about 76% of pre-COVID volume. And it does doesn't seem to be due to lack of capacity. Um, most offices are ready to see more patients. 
It's believed that the vaccine rollout will help some with this, but in the meantime, teledentistry is definitely being used to help um, take care of patients and to ease or to help with practice viability. Outcome data with teledentistry is also showing promise as well. There's now evidence that using teledentistry for oral screening is a viable option, as studies are showing that using it could be comparable to face-to-face -face for oral screening, especially in these school-based programs, rural areas, or areas with limited access to care. Um, also significant is that in November of 2020, the ADA updated its policy and retracted previous statements on store and forward technology and asynchronous technology. Um, that prior to November of 2020, they didn't, they believe that store and forward and asynchronous care was not up to standard of care and they have since, since retracted those statements. Okay, so we know it's growing, but back to the why I mentioned earlier, why is it being used at all, particularly outside of COVID times? And I find often that when people are speaking about telemedicine, they're speaking about the negatives often with statements like there's no physical exam or it's just a prescription mill. And I always find these really troubling because these people making these statements have not educated themselves on the advances we've made in telemedicine in recent years and the professionalization, if you will, of telemedicine as a whole. And while it's true, there are still some prescription mills out there. The idea that delivering care via telemedicine is somehow less than real medicine is just not true anymore. So some benefits to telemedicine, number one, and perhaps the most obvious is access. Access to timely care that meets the patient where they are is one key component to leveling inequities in healthcare. Whether it be patients in rural areas or urban areas, perhaps those that have issues with their own physical mo mobility, those that work long hours and jobs where they can't take time off, or even just transportation limitations. Telehealth can help bring the right care at the right time to these patients. And we know that better access means better care compliance with follow-up visits and thereby better health outcomes. Telemedicine has been long used in coordination of care, particularly in areas like um, cross-disciplinary meetings surrounding oncology. Uh, we've also seen it grow in areas like palliative care, where it's been key in bringing in family members from across the country quickly to make decisions on time-sensitive mat matters. And let's not for forget the softer benefits, particularly for our elder patients, but also for those with mental illness. And even honestly, in 2020, most of us, um, a visit with a caregiver or a provider via telehealth was often the only human contact a patient has that day. And this is where what we call website manner becomes such an important skill. And speaking of mental health, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the possibility of leveraging telehealth to, to allow for a better work-life balance. Um, right now, in a time when burnout is so huge in healthcare, many are turning to telehealth as a way to transition into areas with, that are more compatible with home life or to allow it with time for entrepreneurial pursuits or furthering education. And then of course, there's the cost savings to be have, and this is multifactorial. Huge volumes of patient care and with it revenues can be transitioned into a virtual care space in the coming years as shown by the study from May of 2020. And with a broad alignment between payers, systems and platforms, shifting care in this way is predicted to improve care access, reduce avoidance of care, improve outcomes and improve healthcare efficiency while overall reducing costs overall. And so these factors align to create a really primed environment for, for those ready and willing to seize the opportunity of telemedicine. Another big benefit is overall patient satisfaction. If you haven't run into this yet, you will soon learn that patient satisfaction is a huge part of medicine and for good reason. And telehealth has really made great strides in this area, especially in the last year. There was a study published last week by a company called Sykes, which is more of a product and user interface developer, in which they surveyed 2,000 people about telemedicine in March of 2020 and March of 2021. And there are pretty, some pretty interesting results. Uh, 
first, the great majority have now had a telemedicine encounter of some sort, rising from just under 20% last year to 60% this year. And it's gone really well for most. Um, in March of 2020, 65% of those surveyed felt hesitant about the quality of telemedicine, whereas in 2021, almost 90% want to continue using telemedicine for non-urgent encounters after COVID's passed. Also in March of 2020, 56% of those surveyed didn't believe it was possible to receive the same level of care through telehealth compared to in-person visits. And by March of this year, 80% now believe that it is possible to receive quality care through telemedicine and telehealth. I included this graphic from the actual study to quickly point out some of the other benefits patient reported. Some of these were more obvious like the access uh, notes in the top and bottom corners. But two of these really caught my eye. The first being that six, almost 63% who were afraid to go to the doctor and had their fears, fears eased by using telehealth. And I personally saw this a lot in my own practice, particularly with people over the age of 65. They were terrified to leave the house and telehealth really got them through. The second point that interests me was the fact that 31% felt their doctor came across as more empathetic via when in virtual visits. And that is one real, that one is really interesting because there is a shift in the dynamic when delivering care virtually. And it's important to, to recognize this before you start to deliver care this way. You are going to a patient where they are, often in their homes. And so your website manner has to be different, different than your bedside manner, we say. Particularly with older adults, you'll need to slow down your normal pace even more than you would in an in-office encounter and really focus on the patient in front of you. And your history taking and listening skills have never been more important than they are during a telehealth encounter. And it's important for you to make sure that the patient is comfortable enough to open up and give you great answers. If they feel you're rushing, they're more likely to just shut down, give limited answers, and you'll both leave the encounter feeling like it wasn't fruitful. All right, so we know the terms. And we know it's expanding rapidly and patients want to use it, but how is it done? And when looking at implementation, it's important to know that telehealth is generally split into four categories. So let's take a look at each. Synchronous care is what people assume you, you're talking about when you say telemedicine. It's a live interaction between a provider and a patient or a caregiver and even another provider for consults. Um, most, commonly, most common uses are in the direct-to-consumer space and e-consults from large hospital systems to outlying hospitals or providers. Um, Pre-COVID, Medicare would only reimburse video visit, or visits done via video and only for with certain restrictions. I personally do a lot of video and phone care in my current practice, probably about 70% video, 10% uh, phone, and 20% asynchronous care, which I'll talk about in a minute. And in my practice, patients choose what modality they want to use initially, and it's done in an on-demand fashion. If we see something that requires a higher level of care, we do have the ability to escalate, have them call in via video, or even schedule um, an appointment for them in one of our brick and mortar offices where we typically have same day availability. Asynchronous care is also referred to as store and forward. And this is where a patient or provider sends information for a, pro a different provider to review at another time. And this could be minutes or days, depending on the setup. And this is what we see most used most often in radiology and pathology. And now with a good camera in everyone's pocket, um, these days we're seeing a huge growth in dermatology as well. For the direct-to-consumer portion of, of asynchronous care, generally it asks the patient to respond to questions, give a health history, maybe submit pictures, and so on before the provider ever even sees the chart. Some higher level platforms will actually start to build a chart note for you, even offer the AI will offer presumptive diagnoses, diagnoses and treatments. And so the provider just has to review the information and decide if they agree with the AI or not. Um, in my current practice, we offer store and forward options for things like um, upper respiratory infections, seasonal allergies, uh, simple UTIs, that sort of thing. With COVID, because our platform is designed in-house, we've been able to be very nimble and change 
questions and kind of target more COVID related um, symptoms with our questioning. And for each option, we have certain red flag questions that will trigger a phone call or some sort of escalation in care um, rather than trying to manage something asynchronously that really should be done live. Remote patient monitoring. Um, this is when information is, is automatically sent or electronically sent to a provider to review later. And we see this um, with home monitoring for blood pressures, daily weights for CHF, uh, home INR testing, that sort of thing. Most often in primary care and case management, but also we see this used in um, hospitals like ICU um, and also on SNFs. And then mHealth, um, this is a newer area of telehealth and is growing quite rapidly. These are typically app-based with a some sort of wearable device, like a Fitbit or an Apple Watch. Um, they do things like disease monitoring. You can set up nudges to for things like medication reminders, um, appointment reminders, that sort of thing. This area has existed for years, but it's really seen some expansion in the last two or three. And they're focusing on developing really meaningful app-based programs for healthcare delivery um, to help with clinician decision support. And the FDA is starting to get into regulating this area. Um, historically, it's been a very slow and cumbersome process, and they're trying to streamline the process more. So we should see M Health grow quite a bit in the next five years. All right. So I'm confident at this point, you're all convinced and ready to dive into telemedicine. But if by chance you're feeling a little like this woman, there are a few things that are important to remember. The first thing to remember is that telemedicine is medicine. The standard of care does not change just because you've moved the appointment to a virtual visit. And I'm not gonna get into the specifics of how to conduct a physical exam via virtual means, because there are now a myriad of online courses and even YouTube videos that show you how to do this. We are offering one through PABMT. I know that Hippo Ed offers one. There's, there are now a lot out there. But you may have heard the old saying that 90% of the diagnosis is in the history. And that percentage changes depending on what program you're at. But a lot of the diagnosis is in the history. And this is really what makes telehealth possible. Many times we can make an accurate presumptive diagnosis based solely on history and the exam that can be done via virtual means. Also telemedicine is ideal for many follow-up appointments and some that are simply check-ins, follow-ups on medication changes and that sort of thing where there's really no need for an in-depth physical exam. You could also order testing, labs, uh, radiology, that sort of thing during a video visit, just like you would a regular visit. But for those that are in need of a more in-depth exam, there are, equip there are options. And those options we refer to as peripherals. Um, these are simply devices that make a more in-depth physical exam possible. These are typically maneuvered by an MA or a tech or a nurse that goes to the patient or maybe in the re remote clinic. Um, and even by the patient in some cases. And they allow for auscultation, EENT exams, derm exams, and so on. Um, and so here's just some examples. The top left is a stethoscope, plain and simple. On the right is an otoscopic device, device that attaches to a phone. And these are actually available online at a pretty reasonable price. I've seen these used often in pediatric practices and PDNT practices. Um, and they just take some, a little bit of training for parents and that, can, that part can even be done over video. The bottom left is kind of the Cadillac setup where you get at a suitcase with a laptop and then peripherals like the stethoscope, pulse ox, EKG, um, ophthalmoscope, otoscope, and even ultrasound and some. And, and of course you could buy all of these things separately, but if you have a setup where you're sending staff out to patients, it's really nice to have this all in one setup. All right, and now to bring it back to the theme of the day, how are we gonna care for our elderly and aging patients remotely? And we need to be thinking about our aging patients and specifically first thinking about their readiness to use telehealth. And in a study published in JAMA in August of last year, they studied 
4,525 adult Americans over the age of 65. And what they found was the level of unreadiness goes up, as you may expect, with each decade of age. And I'll talk about the reasons for unreadiness in just a minute, but you can see that people like my mom in that 65 to 74 year old category, um, which are the baby boomers, are mostly ready, which is great considering how large that population is. However, as you move on over the next two age groups, you'll see that they're really not ready to move into telehealth with 44% feeling unready in the 75 to 84 year old group and 72% feeling unready over the age of 85. So this is a chart with the factors contributing to the unreadiness. It can be a little hard to read, so I'm gonna highlight a couple of areas. First, it's important to note that they looked at these factors in 2018 and asked about readiness both with and without social support. So how ready are you to do this on your own and how ready would you be if you had a friend or a family member with you? Next, you can see that they divided the unreadiness factors into tech-related and physical disability. Now the tech-related issues may seem to be the easier of these to address, but they, even these don't really have simple fixes. Starting virtual care for our elderly and aging patients takes some discussion and some planning. You or a member of your team needs to discuss the options with your patients and set expectations for them. Telemedicine visits take some getting used to for patients of any age. So reassurance that some bumps are to be expected, but that you've used telemedicine successfully with people their age is really key to getting their buy-in. As an example for expectation setting, the great majority of seniors have access to a phone of some sort, whether it's a landline or a smartphone. And so they may be thinking that they should be able to receive care via telephone. And telephone visits are useful in some cases, but if you think about your typical elderly patient, they really need a lot more of a physical exam than younger patients. And so a telephone visit will yield less compared to one done for a younger patient. And also telephone visits are rarely reimbursed. So your patient may be looking at additional cost with these outside of COVID times. For those needing access to smart devices, um, some companies are at, like Iora Health and Oak Street Health are actually sending custom formatted tablets to high-risk patients and then connecting patients with health coaches to teach them how to use the technology. For those still tr having trouble connecting, they're actually sending staff to the patients to connect them and sit there during the appointment. Um, Oak Street also actually started doing practice visits to allow patients to connect for trial runs before their actual appointment time. When you're guiding people on, on how to use the technology, it's important to give a written component that has concise language, large print, and screenshots whenever possible. Platform-wise, many practices get to give input on what their patient-facing side of the platform would look like. So for older patients, you should offer a really calm, neutral screen with as few interaction points as possible per screen. And then you, as the clinician, should also assure that you're in a quiet space with a calm background and that you have good lighting so a patient can see you well. And also it's important to use an actual microphone or headset set up for both HIPAA concerns and to help your pa patients hear you better. And then after a visit, a post-visit summary and goals should be sent to the patient in addition to reviewing them orally. And again, these should be easy to read and in larger print. So here are some uh, three examples of platforms. You can see the one on the left has just a ton of, of small text and small icons, and it's really even confusing for, for most people to, at a glance. The middle one is a little bit better, has some icons that don't make much sense, but there's less, it's less busy. And the third setup is really much better with fewer options, large icons, and larger print. And the idea of providing larger print is actually kind of a crossover between tech and physical barriers. For hearing issues, which is one of the barriers found in the study, you'll wanna ask the patient at the beginning of the appointment if they can hear you well, and then encourage them to not be shy about asking you to repeat yourself. Hearing is also one area where it's really helpful to have done a trial run or test visit 
uh, prior to the visit to troubleshoot any audio issues. Also, some platforms are now starting to integrate a closed captioning option. So if you're going to be seeing a lot of, of aging and elderly patients, investing in that is a really huge help for a lot of people. Cognitive issues can be tricky, but just as they are for in-person care, obviously, but those with mild cognitive impairment can still use telemedicine su successfully. Um, here, again, it's important to provide written post-care instructions and definitely involve family or caregivers whenever possible. All right, we've talked about the mechanics. Uh, let's talk about what it actually takes to get started. This is a list of questions I generally recommend people consider when starting in telemedicine. The first two we've pretty much covered in previous slides. The legality question is not as much of an issue during COVID because of all of the emergency waivers, but those are all coming in to an end shortly, hopefully. And outside of those, the laws vary state by state. And telemedicine is one of the areas where it's incredibly important you keep up with the laws and also extremely difficult to do so. The laws that you have to look, consider and follow are the laws where your patients are. You have to be licensed in the state where your patient is physically sitting or resides at the time of care. If you're a PA, your supervising or collaborating, collaborating physician also has to be licensed in the state where the patient is. Also, it's important not to only be aware of your profession-specific laws, such as those applying to PAs or PTs, et cetera, but also telemedicine laws are separate and vary state to state. You must also watch for changes in Medicare and Medicaid laws if you're gonna be seeing patients that are on those plans. Licensing-wise, as you can imagine, working across multiple states can be a nightmare um, when it comes to obtaining and maintaining licenses. I myself am currently licensed in six states, soon to be eight, and each has its own set of requirements as far as um, pre-licensing and CME for li license maintenance. Uh, in late 2019, I actually spoke at a meeting of the Federation of State Boards of Medicine about the burden of multi-state licensing, and they actually have started the process of looking at reciprocity for PA licensure. It's gonna be a gradual process as they work to find ground, common ground where states can agree on a single set of requirements. But the best news is that they actually are looking at true reciprocity rather than a, a compact setup like some many professions have. And then of course, I, you should check with your malpractice uh, carrier to make sure they cover telemedicine and to see at what rate they cover it. Some carriers actually see telehealth as a high risk endeavor whereas some see it as a low risk endeavor. So be sure to check to make sure you're covered. And if they're telling you it's high risk, you should shop around. I always like to give some resources on telemedicine for legalities. Um, of course, PA VMT is here and will continue to be here for PAs and advocate for PAs. If you're a PA or PA student, I encourage you to reach to check out our Facebook group or our website. We offer lots of, of great things for both students and uh, practicing PAs. All of the professional organizations have guidance on the legalities of practice, and most organizations have it down, uh, broken down by state. CCHP, the Center for Connected Health Policy, is a nonprofit, nonpartisan group, and their website is great for looking at a really uh, broken down, succinct, um, look at private payer laws and Medicaid laws, as well as tel telemedicine law in general. The Alliance for Connected Care is a nonprofit lobbying group that advocates for providers and companies in telehealth. Um, they are a great resource for the rapid updates on fast moving legal issues, legislation in play, and also they have a lot of reports and information supporting the use of telemedicine. So if you're looking to get started, that can be helpful in convincing companies and employers that it's worth your time. And then the National Consortium of Telehealth Resource Centers is a national group of, of centers broken down by region that are funded by the Department of Health and Human Services. And they are a resource for anyone wanting to start a telemedicine practice or learn more about telemedicine. And they're a really great place to start. Um, they are there to answer questions for and, and help providers of all types. 
and are anxious to do so. And I've actually been to a couple of, of conferences with the Resource Center here in Phoenix, and they say, please give us a call, let us help you so you're not reinventing the wheel. So I do encourage you to check them out. All right, so we've talked about the how. Um, of course, getting paid is always an important part of uh, practicing medicine. Um, I'm by no means a billing expert, and therefore this information is for general guidance, and I encourage you to talk with your billers um, about questions once you're out there. Um, billing highlights, which can be lowlights. Uh, not all payers will reimburse claims for the same for the same codes. And so you may find that you have to resubmit claims often with different codes. Um, the ENM codes are the code you hear like 99214, 99205, those things. And those codes do not change. And the only difference is that you would add a modifier of 02, which indicates that the location of the health services uh, are provided is through a telemedicine, telecommunication system. There are some other modifiers that indicate what type of service uh, is conducted. However, these are, are really in flux right now. There are some that, um, there's one particular code that was stopped in 2017 and then restarted. And, and so it, it does get very tricky. I should mention that pre-COVID, some insurers, including Medicare and Medicaid, require that a patient be at a facility to receive care via virtual means. And that facility was called the original, is called the originating site. This requirement has been put aside by, for COVID, and we're hoping that's one of the things that they won't put back in place because so often there's no real reason to have a patient travel to a clinic to sit in front of a computer to access care. Um, what this does mean is that you can bill for the distance site where the provider is and the originating site where the patient is and a telemedicine facility fee will be paid to the originating site. And the, there were limits on the originating sites that qualified. They had to be either an office of a provider, a hospital, rural health clinic, um, FQHCs, dialysis, uh, hospital-based dialysis centers, and skilled nursing facilities. There were also limitations on who could do these. So under Medicare, there's the list of qualified providers. Um, they are not, they have not changed during COVID. Currently, uh, previously, patients had to have already been established at patients in order to access care via telehealth. And during um, COVID, HHS is not enforcing that. Um, and then again, the locations had to be the originating site, had to be a rural area. And then the distance site where the provider is had to be, has to be enrolled with PECOS, which is the provider enrollment chain and ownership system. Um, during COVID, they have allowed providers to give care from their home without registering their home because that's public information. Um, they actually can provide care from home and still use the, the clinic that's registered with PECOS. All right. And in closing, we know telemedicine's here to stay even without COVID. From the early imaginings in the 1920s, like teledactyl machine here on the left, uh, we could scarcely imagine where, how far it's come today. And it's really up to each generation of clinicians to understand, adapt, and improve on the last. So it's up to all of you to continue this, this path. I encourage you to advocate for your patients to have access to this care and care via virtual means in general whenever possible. And it's only with your vocal advocacy that we will start to make changes and break down the legal barriers holding up progress. As long as there are barriers, significant legal barriers, the tech innovators will hold back on investing and that holds everything back. So it's really important to advocate for your patients to have care, access to care at the right time and the right place. And with that, I will stop. Thank you very much, Amanda, for that wonderful presentation. I'm gonna ask Corey now if he would be so kind as to make chat available to everyone. And if you have questions, please feel free to type those in and we will go ahead and uh, Amanda will, uh, will begin to respond. So we have one from uh, Dr. Danielson. She says, 
if telehealth is here to stay, which I believe it is, how do we train future clinicians to be competent in virtual care? So that is actually something that has been one of our driving forces with PVAP, AVMT, and I'm sure it's happening with other professionals as well. Um, telehealth has to be integrated into the curriculum of, of healthcare training of all sorts. Um, and we're working to develop curriculum with PA programs currently, um, and it certainly should be done for other programs as well. It's no longer something that you should learn on the job. It's something that you should should be graduating with the education and be ready to hit the ground running um, as a new grad because it will be part of, of everyone's future. So are there, uh, just to extend that question, mm -hmm. uh, are there specific elements of, uh, of curriculum that you think might be global? Uh, um, there's a great deal of, of education around that needs to be done around um, the how to, to give care, how to deliver care, how to do an exam, how to document exams that are done virtually. Um, and that's global. There's a great deal of, of education around website manner, um, professionalism, that sort of thing that's global. And then um, really educating on the technology, where it's come from and where it's going so that people can continue to, to keep an eye on it. Even if they're not currently practicing telemedicine, people should be keeping an eye on where it's going um, so that they can be aware of when it might be an advantageous time to start integrating it. Any other questions? Do you think that the advancement in tech that PA, oh, let's see, I'm sorry. Uh, do you think that with the advancement in tech that PA students will have an entire class on this in the future? Do you think that's gonna be the extent of it? We're actually already working on that. It's uh, definitely um, at least a, you know, a short six week class, um, but we're definitely working on curriculum that, that entire courses could be offered via telemedicine. When the pandemic hit, we actually worked with several programs to um, take their rotations from in-person to rotations online. And we would do um, mock patients setups via telemedicine and we would have um, students shadowing via telemedicine. And so it's, it's definitely coming. Okay. I so, said uh, there's a question concerning uh, house uh, House Bill, Arizona legislation, uh, it's House Bill 2454. Um, have you heard of that one? They don't, uh, it's just- uh, I would need the title. I don't know the numbers, sorry. Okay, they don't have the title in their question. Uh, there is currently a bill in the House of Representatives that is asking for amendments to payments for telehealth services. How can we support those bills? So anytime there is um, a change in or bills up for expanding tele telehealth. Um, one of the ways the first I become aware of them is that I follow the um, Alliance for Connected Care. They send out summaries weekly to do, and they have a great website um, showing what bills are in play. So nationally, currently, I checked last week, there were like 23 bills in play for telehealth and telemedicine. Um, Arizona-wise, anytime you see a bill that is supporting telehealth, you wanna get both um, the Alliance's thoughts on it and um, your, you know, in this case, ASAPAS um, or your DO, what, whichever profession you have, their thoughts on it. But typically the best way is to contact your legislature and it's easy to do now. You, you, you know, you can look up online to find out who your, your representative and your senators are and just write a letter, make a phone call saying that you support this and why. And um, having done a lot of, of lobbying in my in the past, I can tell you that actual contact with patients or with uh, legislatures, legislators uh, makes it a big impact. They want to hear from constituents, and they do actually put move things up on their priority list the more they hear from people. And uh, I've seen a couple questions come through. We will be posting the uh, presentation to YouTube. Uh, as soon as possible, and, a, and communications and marketing will send out a university-wide email with the link, so everyone will receive that. 
Any other questions? Thank you, Dr. Danielson. Thank you. Amanda, thank you so much for this presentation. Thank you, Elton. Wonderful job. Uh, and uh, I will uh, certainly send you the link as well. Great. Uh, so that you have access to that. Um, and thank you all for attending. I appreciate the support uh, that you have for this lecture uh, and the, our ongoing uh, support for educating our students both around current topics and specific to uh, issues related to aging. So thank you all and you have a good day. <laughs>